All right, everyone, thanks for joining us today for day two of ACA Days in celebration of the five-year anniversary of ACA. My name is Laura Masterson. I'm the community manager here at TypeSafe. I'm really happy to have Derek Wyatt from AVIC Networks joining me today to present Igloos and Mountains, where he'll talk about ACA and production. Derek's going to be followed by Mike Nash um, from Bold Radius. He's going to be presenting some do's and don'ts when deploying ACA. So I'm really excited to have both of them joining us today. Um, and before I hand things over to Derek, just a few reminders that may be familiar to you if you joined us in previous webinars or for yesterday's sessions. But um, for new people, these are all recorded, um, and we're going to be making the recordings and the slides themselves available to everyone that registered and post them on our YouTube channel and our website. So look for those in a day or so. Um, and then if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to just insert those into the chat box in the lower left-hand side of your screen. If it's a um, question about audio or sound or anything specific like that, I can respond to you. Otherwise, I'm going to save the more technical questions for Derek at the end. We'll try to make time for a Q&A. Um, after Derek's Q&A, we're going to take a quick break, but stay on the line. There'll just be some brief hold music. And I'm um, just going to get Mike Nash set up for his session. Uh, so with all of that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Derek. Derek, thanks so much for ha joining us today. Oh, thank you, Laura. Looking forward to it. Um, I really appreciate the, the conference that being held right now. It's really nice to have the five year of ACA. And, and we do say ACA in Canada. I'm sorry, it's <laughs> apparently ACA everywhere else, but that's what we do here. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Igloos and Mountains which is, uh, well, I'm just trying to be cute. Uh, our, uh, our logo is an igloo because, well, people think it's cold here. So my name is Derek Wyatt. I, uh, I manage the, the platform at AVIC, which basically means I do a lot of the clustering and the, the ACA stuff and uh, sort of building out on top of that platform. I joined AVIC back in February, so I haven't been here too long. Uh, and uh, when AVIC started, I guess it was about maybe two years ago now, they adopted, uh, they adopted basically the entire TypeSafe platform at that point. And so there's certain uh, real challenges they've, they've faced in terms of what ACA can do, what Scala can do, uh, and things that maybe aren't quite ready or were different than they expected. There's also the usual PEPCACs, uh, the, the the usual user errors that we'll see sometimes when we uh, start playing with ACA. And uh, well, we kind of ran the gamut of, of interesting things to tackle. Um, just a little bit about AVIC and how we use the, the, the platform and, and the product and the architecture in general. What AVIC does is it, it helps simplify the monitoring and configuring of the small and medium sized networks out there. It's, is trying to deliver on the software-defined networking that has been promised for the last 20 or 30 years and has had a difficult time coming to reality. We're hoping that the TypeSafe stack helps us do that. Um, and we, we basically are all in with ACA Scala and Play. If we, we live on this, on this platform. If, uh, if TypeSafe succeeds, and we believe they have and will continue to, then we, we have a pretty decent chance of succeeding. Um, the architecture is software as a service. It, it's a hybrid cloud solution. So we have right now the bulk of the logic and the bulk of the code lives inside the cloud. We have a play front end that sits behind our load balancers, which talks to a series of uh, back ends, which are largely just ACA based. And then we have uh, clustered data storage which we use on for various different things. The cloud does provide the bulk of what we need, but in order to discover customers' networks and things like that, we do need to deploy uh, what we call an on-site agent. These agents are also written in, in Scala with ACA. They call out to some other interesting little uh, Linux utilities and various things to discover networks. But basically, they're meant to be able to be run autonomously. Um, because they can be disconnected from the cloud. If they uh, are disconnected forever, then they're going to be doing a bunch of work for no reason. So eventually they have to call back into the cloud to, to actually let it uh, churn and, and deal with the data that they've accumulated. 
while the on-site component is an ACA solution, it's not technically part of an ACA cluster because the, the cluster API, the cluster um, implementation is not meant to go across a WAN. The internet, the wonderful tubes out there get disconnected a fair bit, uh, which would essentially make them disconnect from the cluster forever. So we have our own way of communicating with our on-site deployment. The overall design is very actor-based. It's, it's very great, like ingrained with the ACA mentality. The, everybody is, a, is, a, is an actor, essentially. All of our customers live as a subtree within the overall actor hierarchy. We have an execution engine, engine in that, which executes code written in our proprietary language. We did write a special language for interacting with networks. All of our data is under that tree. The socket that connects with all of the on-site agents at the customer site is in that tree. Everything to do with that customer is in there. All of the tables, because what, one of the ways to look at the architecture is as a highly distributed and asynchronous uh, database platform. And all of those live inside those actors as well and we can uh, watch them for death and so on. Um, the, with keeping with the actor uh, sort of design, we get a, a, a lot of stuff out of that. All of our customers are isolated from each other. They can't interact. Even if you know, some interesting little actor went rogue on us, it can't go and bother any of the isolated state within any other customer. It's resilient. We try to keep things as simple as we can. Um, if the actor dies, it will restart using supervision strategies, so long as we do keep things nice and simple. It's asynchronous, obviously. And it's all fully non-blocking, except for when we have to go out to the horrible land of databases and things like that. And we also find it easy to reason about. Anyone who has built a fully asynchronous system in the past uh, may find it <laughs> quite difficult to reason about their system. And we find this is a fairly easy system to reason about. The deployment is really using ACA clustering to manage the, well, what are the purple nodes here, really? Um, the front ends and back ends need to be communicating in a mesh style, and it's ACA clustering that, that helps us do that. The the iron on which this run is just defined by Amazon and cloud formation and chef. There's nothing special about that. ACA clustering obviously doesn't give you any of that. It lets you manage your node fabric, but as far as deploying it and making it happen, you kind of need more. Um, and as I said, it doesn't survive across the WAN, so the clustering really is in here. We don't cluster the agents on site. Um, and the back ends and front ends are scaled independently because they have entirely different load semantics. So in cloud formation, we have, we have made them independent in that regard. And the cluster discovery, this is the one interesting bit is, of course, you have to be able to join a cluster. And we make a cluster out of a single seed node, a very well-defined, um, good, stable node in the cluster that everyone can join. And he doesn't do anything. doesn't really run our application. He just runs ACA cluster. Okay. So that's, that's what we have. That's kind of our architecture on, on the 30,000 foot view to hopefully give you an idea of what it is we're trying to deal with. We did hit some interesting challenges and some surprises as we went forward. Um, one of them was cluster singleton. A customer really should be a global singleton in our application. Uh, we found that didn't exactly work, the, the ACA pattern for cluster singleton, because they don't load balance. Essentially, they're going to try and find the most stable node in the cluster to live on, which is the oldest node. Right? We kind of trust him the most because he's been around the longest. Um, we can't load all of our clusters or all of our all of our customers on one node. That's what we don't want. So we couldn't use cluster singleton. Inner classes and closures. There's some really nice, simple Scala programming you can do by just kind of defining things where you want uh, if you want to organize your code that way. And Avic did that a fair bit, and then we started to do clustering and found out uh, we were either serializing the world in some cases, or we couldn't serialize at all. 
the application, when we're trying to get it into production, debugging it is still hard. Uh, it's, uh, it's always been hard to debug an asynchronous application, and <laughs> ACA doesn't really change that a ton. So we had to come up with some strategies to debug it properly and, and make sure that it was performing the way we wanted it to. Uh, and speaking of performance, we did have a fair number of them. The first, oh, first fair while of getting it into production, we had, we had some pretty serious performance problems. A lot of them were due to our own execution engine. Well, we did write a programming language. It's hard to write a programming language and not expect some interesting problems to come out from that. Um, but there are also other ones that we were too, uh, we were a bit surprised with, with dealing with the framework or the toolkit as it were. Play, we have on our front end. And ironically, uh, we found that Play as an ACA application didn't play so nicely with an ACA application. And I'll get into more of this later. It's a bit of a confusing thing to say. But um, essentially, we have a very, uh, I guess, flexible deployment model. And Play isn't so flexible as we'd like it to be. So we, we struggled with that for a bit. And of course, future correctness and await result. Uh, <laughs> there, we'll get into this as well. Uh, await result is just plain evil. Um, I've tried to stress this for years. Uh, it is really the worst thing you can possibly see in any production code ever. I did write one in the book that I wrote on ACA. And uh, I, I may not have explained why that was OK well enough there, and maybe gave people license to, you know, hey, I can use it a lot more than I probably should. But it is definitely a bad thing. The other thing is future correctness, making sure your futures are doing the right thing. Any promises you make are doing the right thing. You're not breaking a big chain of asynchronous computation in the middle without knowing why, various things like this. OK, so managing cluster customers as as our, our cluster singleton, we, we did have to build our own. And it looks kind of like this. The, the node on the left uh, is, our, is our customer manager. He's the, the one true ACA cluster singleton. Uh, it does ensure that we have one of them running in the cluster. And we ask him to do other things for us, like manage the customers. So we can say, please start this customer. And you find the right node. It's not up to us. The customer manager will figure out which node is the best node. We do that very simply today just by saying how many customers are running on that node. Um, we could have one huge customer and a bunch of little customers, or a bunch of little customers, or a bunch of huge customers. We don't know. We just know the number. So it's not the, the most perfect algorithm for figuring out which node to launch somebody on, but we at least have one. <laughs> uh, and he manages all of that instantiation of those customers he also reacts to the ACA cluster events. So he does participate in the cluster by knowing when nodes come up, they come down, they join, they die and leave forever. Uh, and it can, when a customer dies, it can try and rebalance it and put it somewhere else. Using that just let it crash philosophy um, is, is easily done. Uh, so when we when we want to rebalance somebody, we just essentially he just dies. We just let him die. And when he comes up, he gets reinitialized properly. In terms of the, the cluster manager and failover of that regard, we rely simply on ACA. ACA has the cluster manager, or he has the, the cluster singleton pattern. And because he is a true ACA cluster singleton, we just keep him. The problem of closing over the world is that Scala makes this sort of thing just too damn easy. Right? I've got my trait here, and I decided, OK, well, I'll make some classes. I'll make some class messages. It'll all be awesome, and life is good. Inside a single JVM, not a problem. This is really quite simple. But once you try to go between nodes, you want to be able to send the question to somebody and send the answer to somebody else. Well, Chances are these two case classes will not serialize, if you're, depending on what you mix my app into. Um, and even if they did, they'd real, they could potentially be enormous, depending on, because it's going to have to close over this. These guys, by definition, because they're inner classes, 
um, will close over this. And if this is some enormous object graph, it's going to serialize the whole thing. When all we wanted was really just a simple string sent from A to B, um, it's going to close over something enormous. And we are finding this is the case. Uh, we're still tracking down a few of them to sort of shrink our protocol a little bit, um, but it does happen. So we, we're collecting up some best practices for ourselves as we go forward. I'll be summarizing those at the end, but one of the things we do here is try to create a flat class hierarchy if you can. There's really no reason to make these inner classes, so we don't. Okay. Now, as we said, play doesn't necessarily play nicely for us. Um, the, the main problem we found with play is that it just doesn't start like any other app. It's not just the just any other app. It's, a, it's got a special developer mode, a special run mode, and that makes it special in either case. And when we're running locally as developers, we want that play automatic restart. You know, I detected a change to your Scala code, so I'll recompile it and reload for you. So we run, we run the application, the entire thing, using play. So the front end has a plugin that we wrote, and that plugin essentially starts the back end. Okay? Now, that all works great, but we don't want to deploy our cluster like that. We want to deploy our cluster in different configurations. Um, we want to deploy something more like this. We want to have our front end nodes in their own sort of uh, scalable definition. We want the back end in their own scalable definition. Um, and we want to be able to have a standard configuration across which we can start these things so they start up our configurations properly. Like we want to be able to configure the app using Chef in a standard way and so on and so forth. So we want to be able to start the system up differently, but not when it's running for developers. And what we found is that when we configure it, it is different. It Play just makes things different. And then when we mix in an SBT startup mode, and then a main app for production mode, an IDE configuration, it's always just different. And what I found when I first started here, I wanted to change a few things here and there, but then I broke the IDE configuration, or I broke someone's special SBT mode, or I broke the way we wanted to start into production. And everything worked great, provided I didn't want to start play. So we just, it was just something we had to struggle with, and I don't know, we just got to fight through it and figure out the right way to start up the application for yourself. If you don't have a modular design of this type, then you're probably just fine, especially if your, play, if your app is just a play app, you're good to go. It's when you want to mix sort of the underlying backend act, act application with you know, your, your own sort of play front end. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, we just found it to be a bit of a challenge. Um, So, debugging. This is going to be a fairly uh, more in-depth in section. It is, you know, good old Captain Obvious. We uh, <laughs> debugging is hard. If if we all wrote perfect software, um, we'd be in good shape. But there are all kinds of horrible things out there that that plague you. And one of the obvious things is that ACA does make. Uh, make writing concurrent software easier. But it's, there's nothing to say it makes debugging that thing easier. And it really doesn't necessarily. I think it, it, it helps you reason about your app, which does help debugging, but there's all kinds of interesting problems that come up. So one of the things we found was that we had tons of work being done by the fork join scheduler, like tons. Literally it was taking up probably about 50% of our time. We would load it up in JVisual VM, for example, a very simple tool to use. Um, and we saw tons of time being, being done to scan the thread pool to figure out where to stick this thing. Um, so one of the things we realized fairly quick was, well, if your future, if the code inside the future isn't really doing a lot, if it's doing a couple of microseconds worth of work, you might want to try and collapse that with maybe other pit, bits of asynchronous code you have that depend on it. We, have, we tend to generate a large series of asynchronous computations in our compiler. And it's much better for us now if we can shrink the, the sheer number of them, if we can co coalesce those into larger futures, 
then the overhead of the scheduling diminishes, of course. Um, we would have a lot of timeouts, right? We'd just say, oh, this thing timed out, or this, this future timed out, but why? If you have a chain of n futures, then one of them can time out, and that's going to cause uh, some outer future to time out. And it's really not necessarily clear uh, what is happening. We found that to be a, a bit of a challenge, so we had to rejig the way we built our futures. Uh, we're still not quite there. It doesn't, we don't have a great answer for that in general. Knowing how to, you know, it all comes down to knowing how to debug a fully asynchronous application. We have race conditions that shouldn't be there. Now, when we say they shouldn't be there, it's because there's certain guarantees uh, that you can have with messaging in, in, in an actor system. And we would think, well, wait a second. If I'm sending from a message from A to B, why is it that uh, the first message gets there and the second message gets there, but they get there out of order? We just, uh, we, the world has been broken, right? Something horrible has happened. Um, but what, what was really happening was we didn't, we didn't understand what the application was doing. We had put uh, something in the middle, like a future, <laughs> and so we weren't sending a message from A to B. We were sending a message from A to B through some other future in the middle of the pipeline. They were different futures depending on what was happening. And we would see things get, quote, out of order. Now, nothing was wrong. There was no bug in ACTA. It's just life. The, the contract was being maintained. We just weren't recognizing that we had actually done the wrong thing. So there's all kinds of those little things you need to be, need to be aware of. Um, we would have exceptions being thrown in message processors, but messages sent by what, right? You can easily drop a really crappy message in someone's mailbox, like a, a binary awful data that's going to cause some parser to croak and throw an exception. Dropping that thing in the mailbox is perfectly fine. The thread is consumed. You put the message in the mailbox. The thread you know, returns perfectly fine. Life is good until you know, eight weeks later when you start to process that message from the mailbox and it throws an exception during that process. That makes it difficult to debug what, where that thing came from. There was a strategy for dealing with that. Um, we came up with a few. One of them was a great idea, but it was very difficult for us to implement uh, you know, early or late in projects like this. And I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit later. One of the main problems we've had was a side effect in future. This was, this was a pattern that, that sort of got itself ingrained in all of it early on. And essentially, it looked something like this. Create yourself a future. And when it's done, send the result to an actor. Well, this is just the, probably the worst way you could do it. Um, it on success, first of all, returns units. And so that, it's a bit of a red flag that tells you, wait a second, you know, this is not, I can't compose on top of this thing. I can't compose on top of units. So that's a bad thing, right? The bigger thing is futures have this wonderful error correcting logic or error handling logic, and we're just throwing it away. When it's successful, send a result to somebody. If it fails, we don't even know in this case. So that's just a pretty bad way to do it. Um, what we want to do instead is something like this. It might be a little verbose, but this is essentially the spirit of the thing we want. We, we really want to be able to come up with our protocol, come up with an actual application protocol that we use that uh, differentiates the success from a failure, puts it in the context of this database operation we're doing or some other operation. It covers off everything that we have, and it essentially is trying to transform the future into a message. Right? Some result has happened. We want to transform that into a message defined by our protocol. It's either successful or it's failed. In either case, it's coming out of this future, and then we'll use the pipe to uh, pattern in order to get that to our actor. So what we really are trying to do here is use, use, the, use the, the, the future's uh, sort of compositional nature to transform a result into a message. That's the whole point of this operation, this asynchronous operation. And it's easy to understand because we have our protocol there. It catches all the errors that we want. I don't care what it is. It's a throwable. It's going to deal with everything. And it's going to send it to the guy who knows what to do with it. And it composes as well as asynchronous code can. And asynchronous code is, is impure functional code, right, in that sense. So it's got some issues there. 
But this is it, it seems to work pretty darn well for us. And on the I guess on the last bit, the pipe two pattern evaluates some actor as a as a value parameter. So it's not a by name parameter. We haven't closed over it. So if we wanted to use sender here, we aren't closing over the method sender. We're actually computing the result of sender and then closing over that value. So we, we aren't doing a horrible thing there either. Broken promises are essentially the same, the same problem. Now most of us shouldn't be creating a promise. When I got here, I was really quite surprised to see all of the promises that were being made. And there were a lot of promises uh, not being held on to. I mean, they, they were not being fulfilled. So as a library developer, we create promises. If we, if we take in a value and return a future result, we generally have to create a promise. Or not generally, but we may have to create a promise. Um, if you do, you need to make sure that you fulfill that promise. And this, much the same as what we just saw, um, is the, the wrong way to do it if you're using a future. If, you're, if you've got the result of a future, which uh, do some DB thing returns, you You've got a future result, and we are saying, okay, well, for each result that we get, then I want to uh, extract something and then complete that promise. Well, there is a really great way to do this with futures because we can complete the promise with the result of that future. And so the promise can either be succeeded or failed depending on what the future is done. Um, but if in, in the successful case here, we want to transform the, the future that we got by extracting this sum string value out. So we're doing a transformation. But in either case, the future is still what we're completing the promise with. And again, it catches everything. And it works quite well. So if you're not plumbing the future to a promise like we are here, then you're kind of on your own. <laughs> but you have to make sure that it completes. Because if you can imagine you have a series of asynchronous computations. Essentially, it's a chain, right? And if you're going to break that link in the chain, then and no one knows, you know, you haven't brought a promise to a terminal state, then nobody's going to nobody's going to continue. This is a very cooperative system we have here. And so, if some guy is unwilling to cooperate, then you're going to get timeouts. You're going to get aberrant behavior. You're going to get something odd happening. And debugging that is a very or can be a very, very complicated thing to do. As your system gets more and more complicated and bigger and bigger, finding out where you might have broken that link in the chain becomes much harder. So when you're code reviewing, you need to make sure, look at this, look at the promise, look at the future and say, does this get to eternal state? Do I have a timeout on it at least? If you don't have a timeout on your asynchronous operations, it can get much worse. The last sender was another problem. Um, you have to think of the sender as the recipient of your response, not the subscriber to your stream. In some cases, people were using it to, as sort of a, a, an implied subscriber. Something like this. We're receiving a, a, a protocol message subscribe, and then we're saying, okay, well, this guy wants to subscribe to our list of events. So we'll add him, and we'll tell him, dude, you're subscribed. Works great, provided this is the only way you ever deal with it, and nobody ever relays a message. Now, I mean relay in terms of doing another tell and not a forward. Um, if you do a forward, you're fine. But if someone's going to relay it with another tell and so on and so on, then there will be a problem which we'll, which we'll see in a second. But, but this, this would essentially work. As soon as you do something like this, where you transform the, the tell into an ask, well, now you have a problem. The, the sender the ultimate sender that is going along to the guy receiving the subscribe isn't the actor that made the ask. It's the temporary actor that was created to handle the response using the future. And it's a little bit complicated, but, but that's what happens. The future gets created, and the sender is now effectively the future. Now the future is going to go away the second he's handled the response. So what you've essentially subscribed is a dead actor. The guy who made the ask, he's not subscribed at all. There's no error necessarily because the subscribed response will have gone back to the guy who asked. So everybody's going to think they're in good shape, but they're not. The wrong guy is subscribed. Um, so 
if you're, what you need to do is take the sender out of the implied context and lift him into the protocol and say, I am subscribing this guy. Now, it might feel stupid to you because you're essentially going to say, subscribe me, and then say, hey, I've been subscribed. Awesome, right? That might feel a little odd. It's like I'm kind of putting myself in there twice. I'm a sender and I'm the guy in the message. But in the case of the ask, you're also fine because you're, he's ignoring the sender. The sender is the guy who gets the response, not the guy who's being subscribed. And this also works if you're relaying messages. It also works if you're forwarding them, which it would have worked in the last case as well. So that, that is something to remember as well. Use sender for recipients only. Uh, if don't, don't assume he is a long-lived guy or he's even the guy who made the first request because you can put a huge chain of people in the middle. Okay? Uh, tools for, for debugging production. This was another, uh, well, this is <laughs> maybe one of the biggest. Um, when we see, you know, hey, why is, why is the system so slow? Well, there's a very open-ended question. It's the worst question you can ask. Why is the system slow? People ask it all the time, though. Um, we used a visual VM, and we said, okay, well, it's slow. Well, the problem with asynchronous code, of course, is that very rarely is it in the code that you care about. It's in, it's in somebody else's code. It's in some guy dispatching the call or something like that. But it did help us find out that fork join pool was killing us, which we'll talk about soon. Um, so that was helpful. It wasn't zero effectiveness, but it was useful. Your kit was uh, certainly, uh, is certainly more comprehensive than JVisual VM. We still found it to be not super effective, but it was decent. Helped us find a couple of memory leaks, which was nice. Um, but still not perfect. We ended up building our own tools, now mostly to help us debug the proprietary programming language that we wrote, along with the execution engine that, uh, that actually runs it. Um, but that largely is there to help us understand how our app is working, not really what ACA or Java or, or Scala is doing. Um, but it, does, it did help us to understand that because obviously, you know, understanding how our app uh, is working helps us understand how it's using the underlying framework. But the bottom line is we'd still like some better tools. For example, where did this future come from? You know, it's, it may have been the result of a huge line of, of futures from, you know, ages past. Um, but we, it just says, I threw an exception. That's not very good. We would like to know your stack trace plus the stack trace of the guy that you came from and him and him and him up until, you know, the, the original inception of this thing. That would be phenomenal. Um, we would like to know what futures have yet to complete. Do we have a broken link in a chain somewhere? Do we have a bunch of guys out there that are just, they're just sitting there? They're not doing anything. Right? Nobody completed them. We have, a, we have an unfulfilled promise, though. It would be kind of nice to know. Is the actor busy? Is it blocked? Right? I can keep queuing up stuff in this actor, no problem. I can keep putting things in his mailbox, and it works great. But he's not processing them. He's stuck. Right? It would be kind of nice to know. And, and of course, <laughs> All these questions are difficult because it's like, well, what does it mean to be blocked? What does it mean to be busy? How long do I wait? Right? These sorts of questions. Um, which future timed out? I went and I was lazy and I said, okay, I want to pull these 500 futures together, this sequence of futures, and call future.sequence in them. I want to wrap those up into one thing. And you know what? That single future timed out. Oh, crap. You know? Which one timed out? Were there many that timed out? Or, or like were there guys that are all, they were all hopeless. They were all about time out. You know, th things like this would be kind of nice to know. And where did this message come from? Um, would be also nice to know, especially if we do forwards, if we're doing relaying, or we're, doing, we're piping them through futures, things like this. Because as I was saying earlier, I put in a crappy message, and when I processed that message, I threw an exception. Well, you know, it's not, it's not his fault for throwing an exception. He did the right thing. The guy who put it in there, well, he was screwed. Like, he shouldn't have done that. We would like to know who that guy was. And so these questions are a little bit difficult to, to answer. We tried to solve this last one by using something that, that I built, uh, I don't know, about a year or so ago, which effectively lifts all of the messages into our own protocol and, and attaches all kinds of metadata to them. I still like that approach. It worked well at the last company I was at. Um, it's just it's a very difficult thing to graft into an application that has reached this level of maturity. It's not 12 lines of code anymore. 
is pretty enormous. So it, it, it's a fair amount of work. So if you're going to try to do something like that, you kind of need to get it in there early. Um, there's an example of this on, uh, in my GitHub uh, repository or on my blog somewhere where, where it explains how to do this. It's essentially used as an example to describe implicit. Um, and if you want to, I'll let you know. You can check it out. But it, it worked very well for us before, but here it's just too hard to get in play. Uh, okay. The other thing is, of course, one thread pool just never works. It would be great if every application we had to write never had to interact with the outside world. It never had to make a blocking call to a database. This is just impractical. I've never met an application yet that didn't have to do this. So you have to, you have to break up your thread pool. You start, you code quickly. You get your JDBC calls in there. You don't care about thread pools. You just get the job done. Right? Then you start to wonder, well, you know, it starts chewing up threads. And, and I, my system starts to slow down, or it becomes sing, single threaded, or horrible, or I get deadlocks, or I just get starved, uh, starved, starved actors. No one can process anything. Horrible things happen. Um, so you increase the number of threads. And if they're all join threads, as I said, we'll, we'll be getting to that. But you know, you just keep getting more and more threads. This is not the solution to the problem you want. But I, I honestly, I think we did this right. You need to grow your application fast. You need to get in there and do it. And once you've figured out, okay, yes, I need to use this JDBC API. I couldn't use somebody's asynchronous NoSQL API. I'm stuck with this one. Okay. So then you, you use the execution context, which is one of the best abstractions in ACTA, in my opinion. I guess it's in Scala now, but it's a fantastic abstraction. You can use it to, to move work anywhere you want. And when we wanted to push all of our JDBC work onto another thread pool, it was really quite simple to do. We then let the actor thread pool uh, just scale to the number of cores because they're all beautifully asynchronous and non-blocking. We then let the other thread pools uh, scale to the amount of work being done within reason. We don't let them you know, grab 60,000 threads. But as the, as the workload increases and they start sucking up more and more threads and doing nothing with them, just waiting, we want to create some more. And so we found that it works quite well. The execution context is definitely your friend. Okay. So I've hinted at the fork join pool for a while. Uh, this was a little surprising. Um, and we had issues with, well, with basically the not doing enough work and spending a lot of time in code that wasn't ours, which we did not like. So we had a lot of features. And we had, in this case, lots of threads because we hadn't segmented the database yet. Um, and we were using the fork join pool because it's the default, and for a lot of work it, it, it's quite decent. But we got problems doing that. So we found out that the fork join pool scheduler is essentially a big O of n in the number of threads. So if it's going to try to find something to, a thread to stick something on, it needs to scan that, uh, the, all of the threads actually twice as far as it could gather. Um, which was a lot of work to do when you're talking about microseconds worth of uh, every, every couple of microseconds that have to do this. So if you need lots of threads for whatever reasons, then the scheduling work of the fork join pool is really a non-trivial part of your contract. I mean non-trivial. Like it was 50% of our work. Um, and we would rather it be about 3% of our work. So it was a little high. Uh, so we just switched it out. ACTA being as nicely configurable as it is, we said, okay, let's just switch the default uh, thread pool for now to the thread pool executor. And because we were just using one big thread pool, this was just something we could do. And that worked quite well for us. Our, our throughput doubled. Like it, it, we did that and bang. Our, that problem went away and we could move on to the next one. We since circled back and dealt with it in a much better way, but it got us it got us beyond the problem right away. So very nice to have. The other thing that we hit uh, was that some people uh, believe that an await result or await ready, whatever await you want to do, on an active response is very much like a synchronized block, right? Some sort of await on a lock or a, or a synchronized method or something like that. Well, some people are silly. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how many times I've seen this, so I mean a lot of it's, it's a standard mistake. What people don't tend to understand 
is this is what they're dealing with. You're not waiting on a lock. You are waiting on all of this, right? This is your message. You've got, you've got your message. He's, he's going to be, you know, he's, he's right up here. <laughs> he's stuck behind, what, 1,005 messages being processed by this actor. Now, okay, I'm being a bit, maybe a bit hyperbolic here, okay, but, but this doesn't even have to be your problem because you're also fighting with all of your actors in here. They're all trying to work on these little, these four threads down here. And if you have, you may not have a thousand and five messages in front of you for this actor, but it's very possible you've got thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of actors all competing for these four threads. That's a lot of work, right? You're asking a lot. And so if you're waiting on that message to be processed, how long are you going to wait, right? I don't know. <laughs> but you're waiting behind all of these other things. And worse, You've basically taken one of these threads, well, one for every, every time you await, you take them out of the pool because they're sitting there blocked. And maybe now you're down to just one thread for everybody to process all of these other things. And if you've got one more guy doing an await, you're done. You're done. The system is unresponsive. Sorry, you did the wrong thing. So this is why you avoid await.results all the time. Now, when these guys originally had it, it was in a very lightly used bit of code. Nobody was, was calling it. So it was like, hey, this is fine. But then someone wrote some code that, through a couple of generations of calls in the stack, used it, unbeknownst to anybody else. And await.result became a very hot piece of code, and our system wouldn't scale. And no one knew why. Back to the debugging things, right? Why <laughs> it's harder to debug. So it was hard to see that this was the case. We just, I had to instrument all of the places where await.result was being called and accumulate the time that was spent there over a long period of time and then said, hey, look, we're spending all of our time waiting on stuff. Take those out and the application started sucking up 32 cores and we were good to go. Okay? So essentially, if you, if you do this, the, um, the, the object bear will judge you. You, you, don't, you don't want the object bear. He's mean. All right. So, Quick summary, uh, as I was saying, we're trying to come up with our own little rules of thumb here. Uh, this is not a complete list. We are continually growing this list. And so it might be a little light. Uh, but you want to avoid the nested classes. Nine times out of ten when I'm here and I'm doing a code review, even, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. I'm not, I'm not uh, I don't want to, you know, my coworkers might hear this someday. Um, <laughs> I'm very guilty of this. Scala makes it very easy to do this even when it's not needed or necessarily appropriate. You put a nested class in there, a message, something like that. You don't have to. Move it out. Keep your class hierarchy as flat as you can. It, it just helps you down the road. You never use a wait, ever, except in a test. And uh, even then, it's nice if you can avoid it, um, but Sometimes you, you have to, and I mean, let's face it, the, the ACA test kit basically uses a wait all the time. It's that, what that expect message is doing. It's got a timeout waiting for that thing. Uh, keep your futures as pure as possible. If you can avoid a side effect, do it. Putting something in a side effect like that uh, generally will increase the inappropriate things you're closing over. We all should know at this point, I didn't explicitly talk about it, but closing over the sender method is generally a bad idea. If you're, putting the, if, you're, if you're writing a side effect, well, quite frankly, you're possibly going to close over sender a heck of a lot more often. So that's one thing it helps you avoid. It also makes you think more about using your futures as message transformers, because really that's what we want to do. We, would, we want to transform data, and a future is just an asynchronous way to transform data. Um, bulk at your idle. And like I said, I still think we did this quite right. Uh, just code away. Make sure, make sure you understand your app, and then start segmenting the foundations a little bit to make sure you're bulkheading your I.O. or your blocking code from your non-blocking code, and then things tend to run well. Uh, choose your thread pools carefully. Uh, I don't use the fork join thread pool for my database uh, because, well, it tends to make a lot of them, and it's pretty expensive to have a very large fork join pool. In fact, I found it's, it's not that cheap to have a small one either. Uh, as, your num as the number of cores increase, the, and, and thus the number of uh, threads that make sense in the fork join pool, it gets more expensive. Um, so 
you've got to have the right application for that. I, I don't think I've ever written the right application for a port join pool necessarily. So you've got to really think about that. Uh, the sender of the message is the recipient, not the subscriber to a stream. He's, he is just the recipient of that message. Once you've got him and once you've used him for that, throw him away. If you want to store anything, you want to remember anything, then you're going to have to lift that into your protocol. It makes things... These are the subtle bugs that everything works just fine. The compiler likes it, the runtime system likes it, but you start losing a message here and there. That's tough to debug. Uh, keep things simple. Keep your actors very simple and just let things crash. I find that's, that's very nice. The, the default supervision model, although I didn't really talk about this much, the default supervision model is a restart model. And that works really well if your actors are very simple. The more complicated they make them, you make them, the bigger, the fatter, the more responsibilities they take on, the less likely it is that that default supervision strategy is going to help you. It may actually cause some serious problems. So keep them simple. Decompose into multiple actors. There's generally very little reason you need to make a highly complicated actor. You generally should, you should delegate to smaller actors. And people sometimes get upset or the idea they think there's going to be a performance problem. Oh, if I spawn actors to do all these little things, my performance is going to go in the toilet. Well, that's premature optimization and it's evil. Uh, generally speaking, that's not the case. So just, just keep with the actor pattern and keep spawning children. Uh, ask yourself, how does that work when we're clustered? Um, this goes along with the nested classes serialization. Um, we also have to worry about supervision and death watch, making sure you know, your messages could very much, they could get lost a lot easier when they go across the network. Uh, nodes can go down. You can lose uh, actor references that you need to refresh. You have to ask yourself, what happens when this is not sticking inside the same JVM? This is a very big question. ACA helps you a ton with clustering, and it, does a, it handles a lot of difficult problems, but it doesn't handle the problem of, of an entire actor tree dying and you not looking at it. Right? If you're not going to put a death watch on something, then you're the one who screwed up. So you've got to make sure that you know what you're doing when you're in a clustered environment. And the last thing would be to instrument your code. Uh, the tools aren't quite there. Um, your app is going to be special. It's going to be specific. It's going to have its own characteristics and its own problems. So instrument your code and measure, measure, measure. These are, these, these would have, or that, doing that earlier on would have helped us a lot. We're much better off now. But in the early days of deployment, it was a bit of a problem. Um, in general, we're happy. Acker really is a phenomenal toolkit. It's like all of our distribu or distributed code, the asynchronous design is truly an ACA design. Uh, having a fully uh, meshed set of asynchronous database tables in memory and on disk and so on and so forth, all that is very complicated stuff. And for us, it's really quite simple. Um, Scaling out, it's not, like I was saying, the, the clustering system isn't just a natural side effect. You have to think about what you're doing. You have to still write your chef recipes and your cloud formation. You have to pick your cloud provider and so on and so on. But, I mean, come on. Clustering is a very hard thing to do. I mean, most people don't really understand that. And it's a pretty nifty uh, <laughs> set of solutions they've come up with, and you don't want to solve them yourself. Um, Message-based network-oriented programming really is the killer paradigm for the cloud. Uh, ACT brings it to us. We can take advantage of whatever we want. It's phenomenal. Um, and being able to just let things crash, that philosophy is really good for us. And uh, yeah, essentially, we're very happy with this platform. Uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today without it. So thank you very much to the ACA team. And that's it. All right. Eric, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to present uh, for this webinar today. We have a few minutes left for a, a Q&A. So um, folks, we're going to uh, go through the section here. And if we don't get to your question, I'm just going to ask Derek that he follow up with you directly via email. Um, so let's dump, jump into it. Um, Derek, how did you manage customer manager failover? Can you go into that, a little bit more of that? Well, the, we haven't tested that as well as I'd like right now, um, but it's, it is a cluster singleton straight out of ACA. So, and that's, that's, the, uh, that's the joy 
of, of what it's supposed to bring us. Uh, I've seen it happen a couple of times uh, in very, very clean room situations, and it worked pretty well. Uh, but we haven't had it happen under dire circumstances yet. So I'm, I'm just hoping everything is awesome with that, to be perfectly honest. But essentially, that's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Okay, cool. Um, next question, how many uh, customers are on each node? How many overall? It depends. Uh, like I was sort of, I, I alluded to this earlier, but um, certain customers will be of different size than other customers. Uh, essentially, if we, we have to scale customers based on the size of their networks. Uh, if, you, if you have a single switch in your network with, say, 200 interfaces on it, that's, that's 200 interfaces to us. If you have 500 of those switches on your network, then that's 500 times 200 interfaces. And that's a lot for us to model, scan, map, so on and so forth. So it's variable in that regard. And as I was saying, that doling those out to different nodes. We don't have a great algorithm for that right now. We just go on the number of customers, not the number of interfaces or things like this, or the load on that system necessarily. So it's a pretty simple algorithm now. And it, all, and it also depends on the size of the nodes we have. Those tend to, uh, we've been varying those. Uh, it used to be 32 cores, now I think we're down to eight. Um, various differences. So they just get, it's, we sort of live with what Amazon does for us with the, with the scalability, like the elasticity, and, and mm -hmm. what ACA does for us with nodes up and down. Got it, okay. Um, next question, on your own cluster singleton, why not use the inbuilt cluster sharding? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what that question is. The, I don't know. Uh, I guess uh, this is probably alluding to, uh, alluding to, I guess the sing maybe the singleton has a shard. I don't know, I'd have to write that down. If it does, um, then we'll use it. Uh, when I first started here, I've never actually done clustering before I came to Avic, and they had a strategy in place. So if there's an enhancement to like a, the cluster singleton that I'm not aware of, then we'll have to try and employ that because we'd much rather use that. Well, well, maybe you can follow up with this individual um, via email and, and chat about it a little bit more. Sure, yeah. Uh, couple, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, how do you keep track of data flow when the actor system grows? Uh, we, we don't. Really, um, I'm not sure if that's if the data flow question is about the data flow feature. Uh, we don't use data flow as like an ACA proper feature. Um, mm -hmm. But when, as the actor system grows, each sorry, and one of the things is that um, is is that I guess maybe between the agents and the servers, there's different actor systems. But I don't know if that was part of the question. But we don't generally deal with it. It just is. <laughs> Um, it may become more of an issue as we grow bigger, but right now it's, it, we don't have an issue with it. Okay. All right, let's do one more, and then um, we can follow up with everyone else via email. Uh, last question. The closure serialization size issue means that it's not feasible to use ACA with Java uh, with not Scala when it comes to implementing the actor model meant to scale and perform well. So dicey here. Are you able... Do you, do you want me to send that question to you directly, Derek? Yeah, that'd be better. I think. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, all right, guys. I think we're going to wrap up. We're going to take a quick break and uh, get Mike set up for his presentation. Derek, again, I wanted to thank you uh, for taking the time today. This was really great. Um, and everyone, look for the recording uh, in the next day or so, as I mentioned. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, for the second day of ACA Days. Uh, this is our presentation with Mike Nash, joining us from Bold Radius. Uh, I'm Laura Masterson, Community Manager here at TypeSafe. Really happy to have you all back. If you missed the first part of the webinar series, just a couple of reminders. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, and um, if you miss any parts of Mike's presentation or when we Rewatch at a later time. We're going to be making everything available on our YouTube channel and website in a day or so. If you have questions throughout the webinar, just feel free to insert those into the chat box on the lower left-hand side of your screen, and I'll um, respond to those if, if I can, and if not, then I'll save them for the end for the Q&A. Um, all right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Mike. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Really ha happy to have you on board. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here.
So everyone, uh, my, I'm Michael Nash. I'm with the Bold Radius team. Um, I'm also in Canada, uh, actually in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan today. Um, we're a custom software development training consulting firm uh, and of course a TypeSafe partner. Let me just get our first slide in place here. Um, so my little segment today is going to be about some do's and don'ts when deploying ACA into production. And in uh, over the last oh, almost five years now, in the process of deploying a lot of different ACA based services and applications, um, our team has come up with uh, you know a few lessons learned and a few uh, locations where the potholes are, and developed a bit of a checklist of things to consider when you're asking yourself, are we ready to go? Is it is it is it time to begin you know pushing this thing out to production? Are we ready for customers to see it, um, or is it going to be horrible? So in this segment, we're going to talk about some things you think you should we think that you should review when you're getting ready to deploy your ac application into production. Um, the list isn't exhaustive, of course, by a long shot, but it should get you thinking about a few aspects that maybe some of which you haven't considered. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some overlap to some of the other presentations you've seen. This one will be a little higher level. We've tried to sort of distill knowledge out of a number of different deploys and found things that do recur uh, over time. So we'll breeze over pretty quickly. If you need me to slow down or I'm boring you and you want me to speed up, just say so in the chat. So I've broken this into three chunks, and the first chunk is about architecture. Um, basically looking at your architecture and saying, do you have a production-ready architecture? Have, have you got the shape of this application appropriate for making the best use of ACA? Um, I can definitely recommend the Manning book Reactive Design Patterns, by the way, for more of the deep details, um, if, you'll, if you don't already have that one. You know, the fundamental architecture of your app, of course, is driven by its domain. It has to be shaped according to the problem it's trying to solve. But the infrastructure, if you're using ACA, needs a little bit of attention as well. Let's have a look. Okay, so the first thing to look at for architecture is you, you can't allow code quality to slip. I think Derek covered some of this too. You have to slow down and learn the tool sufficiently to know that your code quality isn't uh, syncing because it will be very noticeable in ACA application. So what will getting the architecture right do for you? There's really nothing new about this advice. Uh, it's, it's nothing impractical. It's all about quality. Um, quality is, comes right down to dollars and cents. Quality saves you money, saves you time. Um, you, it's easier to solve the problem at an architectural level and keep the code quality high than it is to debug it later. Um, getting it right and keeping quality high, we found, can do more for keeping the overall cost of a project under control than just about any other factor. In our projects, we found that it's important to keep the infrastructure and the domain, and the infrastructure meaning how you implement things that are not specific to the problem domain being solved, and the domain class is cleanly isolated. It lets you, for example, do things like upgrade to the latest version of ACA without a lot of effort. Uh, and that's usually very worthwhile. Some great things are happening. You know, ACA moves fairly quickly as frameworks go or as libraries go, and being able to upgrade to the latest one without a lot of grief is worthwhile considering in your design. Something we've also found is that uh, architecture matters from the ground up in that retrofitting concurrency or ACA itself into an existing architecture, that's a tough one. Um, you, you can do it, but it's not going to be, I mean, maybe this is a Captain Obvious statement again, but it's not at all as easy as it, as it is if, of course, you have the opportunity to bake it in from the beginning. The ports and adapters onion architecture pattern um, I mentioned here is the one we've found very effective for doing that separation of the infrastructure and the domain. What's talking about? So also sort of under the topic of architecture is delivery guarantees. Again, some of the other presentations talked about this. You need to understand what guarantees ACA provides uh, as configured and what it doesn't. The default guarantee for delivery of your messages is an at most once guarantee, meaning delivery is not actually guaranteed to occur at all. Um, now, by configuring things such as ACA persistence and different functionality like that, you can, of course, adjust that, but you need to know what it is, and it has a huge impact on your application. 
Of course, ACL also provides a, a, an ordering guarantee per sender-receiver pair, um, assuming that's actually the sender and receiver and that there's nothing in between, as Derek pointed out. That's usually not as important and could go out the window depending on what your retry policy is if you have retries as well. So in your architecture, think about what delivery guarantees you're assuming and if those assumptions are actually what are provided. We've found this one of the biggest areas where architecture can go wrong and you don't quite notice it until you're actually starting to put your application into production or about to. Um, more actors, for example, is not always better. You, you, just increasing the number of actors arbitrarily is not necessarily the right thing to do. And it's often a, a, a solution that people seem to try at some point. Oh, it's not going fast enough. Give me some more actors. Not quite that straightforward. So an, a, an obvious one, but one that you have to think about and is very much an architectural concern is to look for single points of contention and single points of failure, but that's a different topic. It's not that different from what you'd look for in any application. You're looking for where the bottlenecks are going to be. Are you designing your application in such a way that there are a lot of bottlenecks? Is there just one? Can you reduce those bottlenecks? This, again, is very hard to retrofit. This is something you want to think about ahead of time. It's, again, one of those things that can really dilute the value of an otherwise reactive application. What we found is there's a reactive application and there's an almost reactive application and there's a surprising amount of value lost in the almost reactive application. Um, structures such as uh, CQRS, event sourcing patterns, as discussed in some of the other sessions, uh, help reduce these single points of contention. Something we found very important is to let every service, we, we often use the microservice uh, architecture as well, or the pattern, and to allow each service to worry about its own persistence. Think of them as completely isolated. This is sometimes a hard sell for traditional developers uh, that have come from like the J2EE world that are used to having essentially one big honking database that you put everything in. We found lots of little databases, potentially completely different types of databases, or even maybe not a database, is actually a better solution. Um, so we, we keep services isolated and their persistence and internal concern of that service. So don't, for, don't fall into the pour it all in one database and hope for the best um, without a good reason. Not sure I've ever seen a good reason for that, but I think you get what I'm saying. So blocking operations, obviously. Uh, you know, it, it would be great if we could write applications that where everything was non-blocking. I haven't seen one of those either. Um, so somewhere you're going to need to do I.O. Uh, that's the most traditional cause of blocking operations or slow operations, but there's a lot of others that we've found that we don't think about ahead of time. So I'll try to pass some of that on to you in some of the later segments. Some of these will show, some of the blocking operations will show up during performance testing, and I'll talk a lot about performance testing in a little bit. But finding them, thinking about them ahead of time, finding them at an architectural level is obviously a whole lot better. If you don't create the problem, you don't have to fix the problem. Think about what's going to hold on to a thread. Yes, usually it's I.O., but not always. And where do the blocking operations happen in your application? Inside an actor? You're going to have them. You must. But where they are matters. If I start getting too quiet or going too fast, somebody complain in the chat, by all means. Um, so here's the Captain Obvious segment for sure, immutability. But we've seen it done wrong. <laughs> the idea is that you should encapsulate state in your actors or agents. That's possible too. We haven't used agents a lot, but in a few places we have. Um, but it, it can be missed. You can end up with a message with that isn't immutable, for example. Um, that, these are very subtle problems, and, and, but very clear in a code review. There's a reason that VAR shows up uh, as, a, as red in IntelliJ by default, for example. Um, we found small, specific messages, short case classes, work a lot better than large, complex ones. Even if you're representing a fairly complex event, better to break it into lots of small messages. The temptation to fall back on, on mutability uh, tends to fall it tends to fall away when you're not dealing with a very large class, which I guess is another way of saying keep it simple. And in a lot of ways, in in the very fundamental way, ACA is really a very simple toolkit at its heart. But you need to understand its philosophy and let it stay that way for best results. 
um, unintentional cruft accumulating, unintentional complexity accumulating has been one of the biggest flaws we've seen and it can cause a lot of trouble. Systems comprised of lots of small pieces that are, as I said before, as independent as you can get them seem to work best. They're also easier to diagnose in the sense that you can look at the overall flow of the system and diagnose that. Most of the trouble we've run into in the past has been basically trying to be too clever or too clever too soon, which is kind of the same problem. Uh, data being a private concern of each component, yes, I'm saying that again. It's worth saying again. Um, sharing things via a database, not a good plan in a reactive system generally. Something that we've found is we're, we're starting to make almost a rule, unless there's a good reason to break it, like all rules, is to use data transfer objects, DTOs, on both ends, as we call it. In other words, a DTO for receiving data from a REST API or something, and then a different DTO to communicate with a persistence mechanism if there is one. And neither of these are the same class as the domain object of the application. Um, that's good sanitation in a lot of ways, and it seems to really help isolate problems that otherwise crop up later. So in the, in the kind of the CQRS speak, we, we've got two kinds of objects flying around, commands, things that you want to happen, things you're telling the system, I want this to occur, and then events, which are things that have happened in the past. Those are the two things that we tend to represent a lot in our domain. Keeping it that simple actually makes for a lot of, um, a lot of opportunities to go wrong don't happen in the first place. So that's why architecture is so critical. So a biggie, back pressure. And of any event-driven system, ACCA or otherwise, but particularly ACCA, needs a way to apply back pressure under load. Uh, pull is one way to do that, as opposed to doing push. Um, we found that push with an acknowledgement message is better. Um, we built a very large system that way, and it's worked very well for us. There, there's tons of stuff to read out there. I'm, I'm not here to teach you this stuff. I'm here to say these are things to think about, and that the easiest thing to do when you're first learning ACCA is to not think about back pressure and think that it's something I don't have to worry about uh, in a production application. You're not ready to go to production if you haven't thought about it, is I think my comment here. Certainly find out about uh, ACCA streams. That's the new reactive streams implementation for ACCA. It's young. We didn't use it in our, in, uh, in our previous projects. We might, of course, in the future. In our experience, the way you know you have this problem sometimes <laughs> at first is when you run out of memory very quickly under load. Uh, you've probably missed a back pressure point somewhere. Um, you might be uh, lured to have a quick look at uh, bounded mailboxes, and we, we did. We went, oh, hey, we could use a bounded mailbox for this to solve this problem. Not really. That's, that's not really what they're for. It's no substitute for proper back pressure and an acknowledgement message. Um, it can help you find a problem, it general, in our experience, in any case, didn't help us solve a problem. Okay. Let's see. This is an interesting one, serialization. And I think Derek touched on this a little bit. If you're using remoting, and, and we did, we built a system um, with a, an event bus mechanism uh, over remote actors, then the method you're using to serialize and deserialize your messages is important. Just using uh, Java default serialization has a cost in production, and that cost is class path management, because now you need the definition of that class on both ends of the wire, so to speak. You need two different pieces of your application that are supposed to be as independent as possible, two different services, to have basically access to exactly the same class. It, in fact, exactly the same version of exactly the same class, because Java serialization can be a little picky that way. That can cause you, although that's the easy way to do the serialization, just leave it the default, that actually causes you more problems in deployment and update problems over time, we found. Uh, you update one service with one version of a class, you know, the class moves, and suddenly it won't deserialize on the other end in places. So picking a format, something like JSON, protocol buffers, thrift, that can decouple these, these issues a lot. Uh, we tried protocol buffers extensively, still kind of had the problem of sharing the definition of the class. The versioning was a lot better because, of course, it's meant for that, but you still have to share that definition. Whereas uh, something like JSON or good old text is so simple that you, you, uh, you basically deserialize by convention. 
to a degree. And it does mean that versioning is even easier, but there's trade-offs. Again, you're, you're losing a little bit of the type safety. You could receive many JSON uh, conceivably. So you have to think about your error handling for that. But short answer, think very carefully about serialization, particularly when you're dealing with remote actors. And benchmark your serializer and deserializer. We've been surprised at the variability in performance between different serializers. A JSON 4S versus uh, Spray's serializer, Spray JSON, for example. Um, and it doesn't seem to be that one is just faster than the other all the time. So benchmark it, measure, don't guess. Okay, uh, just a quick deviation again, sort of talking about uh, architecture. ACA isn't all about actors, uh, although it's actor based. There's, of course, futures. There's also agents. Um, where to use which one? Let me, let me simply say that it's important to think about all of these and where the right place is to use the right thing. Encapsulating state is ideal for an actor or behavior, uh, but you can also encapsulate value uh, in an agent and do asynchronous updates. So it, learn about them. Um, don't, don't dismiss everything as saying, okay, it's all actors all the way down. Um, that's important. Let's see. Okay, one close and dear to my heart, testing. Um, in this section, we're gonna talk, this is the next major section, we'll talk about testing. What can you do to increase your confidence that your app is ready for production, right? There's always that moment where you push the button and go, okay, it's now in front of users for the first time. Hopefully you've been continuous deploying to production all along, but now you're actually going to turn it loose on real live people. Is it really gonna behave? And that's surprisingly difficult to just predict uh, theoretically with a reactive application. So let's talk about how we can do that. So we're going to talk about testing a little beyond the obvious. I'm going to just go ahead and make the assumption that you're doing, you know, unit tests and you're using test kit to ensure that actors are behaving as they should. An interesting one on test kit though, make sure you include negative tests. In other words, what happens if I send a bad message to this actor? Have you covered that class? You know, have you covered that case? Sorry. Um, we found that ACA services get a lot of value from integration tests. We, we tended to write a lot more integration tests when we were working uh, with ACA, and they were more useful than the kind of smoke test integration tests that we were writing for non-reactive apps. We got more value out of them because ACA is a very, uh, literally a reactive system. It reacts very quickly and clearly to load, and not always in the way that you necessarily wanted it to or that you were anticipating it was going to. So tests help a lot in that area. Some of the stuff we've used for testing, some of the tools, there's other tools, but this is what we've had some experience with, um, are, are listed here, some of their logos. Um, one thing I can say, don't defer stress and load testing until you have a problem to try to sort it out. It's a whole lot easier to do it early and go, oh, I see where this is going, as opposed to, oh, I see where we've gone and we don't like where we are now. And now we have to back up and go, wait a minute, that we've, we've missed something at an architectural level because we didn't understand something. You know, the, the whole idea of a reactive application is tuned and structured a little differently than what you might be used to. So it helps to see what, it, what your system behaves like under load very early in the process. Uh, we really like Gatling. We do a lot of Gatling tests. Don't wait to use things like Visual VM until you run out of memory. Um, fire it up early. Fire it up when you first have your prototype and see what the most common objects are in memory. Do you understand why? <laughs> you know, you look at something and go, well, that's interesting. Why do I have 50,000 of those case classes in memory at the moment? What's going on? You know, or, or where is performance going this early in the application? You'll see things much earlier if you start that uh, early in the process. So Gatling is for load or stress testing the application from what I like to call the outside. In other words, it uses your API, usually a REST API, to uh, simulate the user load beating on your application. And then, of course, you can monitor your application to see how it's responding to that load, and it will give you quite sophisticated graphs and charts to say how, you know, were, did requests fail, did they succeed, how many of them, how fast, how many per second, and so on. That's testing on the outside. Things such as Caliper and Scalameter, we, we use Scalameter a little more. We had a hard time getting Caliper to work quite right. Are, are, they call them micro-benchmarking tools, and they're for testing 
uh, more white box. In other words, you, you open the box and wrap a caliper test or a scalometer test around a specific chunk of your application. Um, generally not at the integration level. You can actually call methods and just you know set it up like an ordinary uh, uh, Scala test or uh, Specs2 test. So Scalameter lets you say, for example, this is what you'd use to uh, test uh, a serializer, a serializer or deserializer. In fact, we've done exactly that. And yes, we can share those results. I saw that go by in the chat. Um, they're, they're very interesting and, and in some cases surprising. So that's what we use Caliper and Scalameter to. They also take into it, it's, it's much better than just writing something in a loop because they take into account things like um, JVM warm-up time, doing it over a number of repetitions. Like we had some very odd results when we tried this with pickling. We found that uh, it wasn't so fast when we did a few serializations, deserializations, but then when we did a very large number of them, it was faster. And then I can't recall which serializer it was, went exactly the opposite way. It was smoking fast at first, and then when we loaded it up over a long period of time, it got slower, and that confused us. So definitely uh, check out the micro benchmarking tools. Um, Visual VM, your kit, as Derek mentioned earlier, profiling, memory, CPU, we usually end up using Visual VM. Usually we're looking for memory issues. That's, uh, the, that's our, our um, harbinger of problems in mailbox size, generally. Um, but there are some other tools that I'll tell you about that are sometimes way more useful at finding that kind of problem. So test early, test measure, don't guess. Let's see. Oh, yes. Um, this is always fun, JVM tuning. I've um, spent a, lot, a fair while talking to our operations team on various projects uh, and talking them into giving us enough memory to get good performance. Um, here, here's my favorite JVM tuning tip. Uh, give it some more memory. Uh, just because it runs in that much memory doesn't mean it will run well. The, uh, we'll get into this in detail later, but um, you can tune an awful lot of things in the JVM. The defaults are... I, I, seldom found an application that does just fine in production with the defaults. I'm almost always changing something. Uh, generally garbage collection, you can change uh, CPU usage, lock contention, I.O. Um, thread locals are usually not your friend. I have a note on this. I, I don't know why I stuck that on here, but I, I, I apparently thought of it while I was talking about JVM tuning. Okay, let's dig into a little deeper into tuning and garbage collection and so on. You probably need more memory than you think you need. Um, and the reason for that is when you learn a little bit more about how, and you know, this is almost a, a JVM issue more than it is a Scala issue, but it's kind of a Scala issue as well because Scala uses memory in interesting ways. The, the actual usage of your application is deceptive. Just because it looks like you can run in that amount of RAM, you're probably spending more CPU time garbage collecting than you want to be. It's very important to uh, use things like verbose GC to see garbage collection. Again, I'll talk about that in some more detail later. Um, but it's, it's one of the first things I look for when we deploy an app and go, oh, that's not going so hot. What's wrong performance-wise? Uh, or why aren't we just getting the performance we expect? Is The first thing you want to get out of the way is, are we starved for memory? Um, and are we spending a whole bunch of time garbage collecting? So let's talk about garbage collection a little bit. It's always fun, right? Um, only running your application under some kind of realistic load. So all of this knits together and goes right back to what we were talking about with, with Gatling. Only running under realistic load is really going to show you what your characteristics are in terms of garbage collection. It may look fine with a quick, you know, uh, a scalometer style uh, performance test, and then when you fire everything up together and run a, a heavy Gatling test against it, all of a sudden you realize, now what actual memory characteristics you're going to see. Um, if you're leaking memory or appear to be quotes leaking memory very quickly, it's probably not a leak, you are very likely filling a mailbox very quickly. So you need some other st stats, which we'll talk about later, to figure out, okay, what's going on? Why is the consumption rate and processing rate of all of the actors in my system not tending to even out over time? Why would, it, why would something be bottlenecking? Um, could be as simple as you didn't think of back pressure, but probably not. So, like I said, many times, garbage collection is one of the reasons you want a little more memory allocated than you might think. It takes memory to get more memory back, so the garbage collector itself takes some RAM. Um, check out the concurrent mark sweep implementation. Might be the one you're looking for, might not, 
Google's your friend. But may, oh, here's one we've fallen down a couple of times, and this one hurts at the bottom. Make sure that you're looking at the information relevant to your version of the JVM. There's all sorts of great articles. You read it and you think, oh, this is a great way to tune the, the garbage collector or tune the JVM, and then you go, no, that option doesn't work at all with you know, Oracle's JDK7 or whichever one you've actually got. So make sure you're looking at the one for your JVM. They do vary uh, in surprising detail. Okay, <clears throat> enough about testing, and uh, we'll talk a little more about something very related to testing uh, in a couple of slides, but now I want to go on to the last section here, which is all about production deployments. So let's say you've architected it right, you've tested it within an inch of its life, you've got confidence. Now, how do you go about actually getting it in front of your production users? This is a little more complicated than it sounds. This, is a, this section is all about things to think about in building your deployment pipeline. I'm assuming your, your deployment is automated and there is a pipeline, um, but we'll talk about that too. So, uh, whoops, wrong slide. Okay. So, getting your app to production once is usually not the problem. Getting it to production every time, automatically, repeatably, reliably, with all of its dependencies, and being able to restart it without causing user out outages, that's usually more interesting. Now, lots of little microservices help in the sense that one of the characteristics we found when we had our highly distributed ACK apps is that you can take some of the services offline just fine, and the system will simply queue and then recover when the service comes back online. Now, of course, that's not true for things that are user-facing, so you have to know the difference in the pieces that you're going to deploy. A nice short cycle time on deploy allows you to respond to problems. You never want to do the you know, panic, panic, quick, deploy this fix to production, but it's nice to know you can. So you don't want that, that pipeline to be too slow. You want the flow rate through that pipe pretty high. Um, a big one for the deployment pipeline is checking your dependencies. I like the SPT dependency graph plugin. Um, I find it very helpful. Look carefully at any transitive duplicates. In other words, there's the same library in there because it's depended on by a library that you depend on. And it's in there twice in your single class path. Uh, multiple logging implementations is my favorite one that I've been bit by a couple of times. All of a sudden, logging is not working. You're going, what happened? Um, if you get messages to do with uh, this method signature does not match, then you, you may well have a problem with uh, uh, with multiple things, on, multiple versions of the same library on your class path. Here's a question to ask yourself. When your app comes up, let's say your deployment pipeline processes and it deploys a new version of your app onto your production servers, well, first onto your staging servers, then onto your production servers, how do you know that's the right one? This is a question we had to ask ourselves and kind of chew on a little bit. We, okay, the app is up and it's responding on some port, let's say, or it's, a, it's consuming messages. Is it the right version and the right revision of the app that we just deployed or did something fail and we just started up the old one again? Um, that's one of those potholes I was talking about. We've broken an axle or two in that one. Uh, what we found was it was possible to have the build process tell the application with a, with a file, basically. Um, here's your version and revision. And then when we started up in production, we, of course, checked that uh, with an automated script. Also written in Scala, as it happens. And that kind of brings you to deployment packaging. OK, you're deploying your application. What does that mean? What is, what is your application? What is the final artifact? Um, we've had good luck with the Uber jar idea, e.g. a single jar file that contains all of the, uh, all of the dependencies. We were using Spray to do that. Um, Play has its own de deployment mechanism that's a little different. Um, that works just fine on its own, but it, it, it doesn't necessarily lend itself right to the, uh, to the Uber jar idea. But we always have some manner, when we do these microservices, we always have some manner of um, URL or, or port that it can open that we can query to say, well, for starters, are you running? Are you there? Uh, is anybody home? And also, what's your revision or version? So that our, the deploy tool I was just talking about can actually say, yep, we've got the right one. That deploy was actually successful. Um, we typically deploy multiple JVMs on each virtual machine. So in other words, on a single operating system instance, we've typically got multiple JVMs running. Um, we've had good luck with that pattern. Other people have said they swear by a single JVM uh, per virtual machine. We've found that's really not necessary. If you give it enough memory and it's a large enough box, there's no reason you can't have multiple JVMs. You can also use the quality of service uh, capabilities of your operating system to make sure that one of them doesn't run away with the machine. 
because that's happened as well. And of course, things like rolling restarts have to be considered for user-facing apps. It's interesting, in, in the ACA world, frequently you can not worry about that for services that aren't user-facing, because as I said, they'll just queue up and come back when, they, uh, when they're available again. So deployment packaging kind of leads us right into dependencies. And this, it's, it's funny, this sounds obvious. It sounds like I should have the Captain Obvious sticker at the top of this page, but it's more difficult than it sounds. And an awful lot of work has been done to solve this. Uh, tools like Docker and so forth help because your dependencies aren't just what's on the class path. There, there are a lot of other things. So having, uh, and like I said, one of the big problems we've seen a number of times, and it's an awkward little thing to fix, is when you have one in, more than one instance of the same thing on your class path. What that really is saying is that my application is now non-deterministic, because what order those classes will be loaded in isn't necessarily guaranteed, particularly if you're moving from one platform to another, like you're developing on a Mac, de deploying on Linux, all of a sudden something breaks. That's, we've seen that a few times. Um, tools like Docker can help, particularly with the external dependencies, uh, e.g. things that aren't part of your class path but are, are around it. Um, it can also add a lot of complexity if you're not very careful. So it's something we seem to have found. Um, things like, for example, when I say dependencies, I'm talking about everything from the operating system, database if you've got one, front-end systems like Nginx, those are all dependencies. If it has to be there for your app to run, that's a dependency, and you should manage them. You know, you can't simply say, oh, well, the environment will be fine. If some of those external dependencies shifting, of course, can have a catastrophic effect on your app, ACA or otherwise. Some of this applies equally well to non ACA apps. What we found is that the DevOps model um, of, of working where there are either people embedded on your team that are operations or whether you just have people that are both developers and people that can do operations works really well with an ACA application because the ops setup is probably a little unusual compared to, quote, traditional applications, uh, you know, things from the JVM world where you're deploying everything into a big container and it tends to be um, the war pattern, you know, where you've got a, a large chunk of stuff all together. Um, the way you tune the system, the way you deploy, the criticality of deployment, the whole build pipeline is completely different for ACA apps and for, I suppose, any kind of microservice app. Uh, that's composed of a lot of individual pieces, and that goes a lot better if your developers and your ops people are either the same people or at least talk to each other a great deal and sit in the same place because then those issues don't become somebody else's problem because they're, they're, they can't become somebody else's problem. That just doesn't work well. Okay, dependencies. The other thing you've got to think about in your deploy pipeline is configuration. Now, it's funny, the, the most common problem we found with ACA applications is people trying to fix ACA's configuration model. Um, in our opinion, it isn't broken. It, it works great. Um, we just use the, the TypeSafe config library, and we, we go with the flow is sort of the, uh, you know, when you go against the flow, you might get eaten by a bear. It's kind of what the image here is trying to imply. Um, we've seen people develop incredibly sophisticated configuration systems that were... Um, were unnecessary in our view. Uh, ACA's configuration model works fine. Discovery often beats hardwired config though, um, e.g. if you can have your system figure itself out once it gets to its deploy platform. That beats hardwired values um, and is more flexible, allows for more flexible system changes at runtime. And something we've, we've tinkered with and had some luck with is um, last minute configuration information being sent as an actor, as a, sorry, as an actor message to the running system literally let the system become what it needs to be at runtime. Uh, and we've, there's pitfalls there, but it can be very valuable if, if that fits your particular deploy model. So I definitely encourage you to, to, uh, to consider that, to consider uh, just using ACA's you know, built-in config system and sending messages. Okay, one of my favorite areas that I'm going to spend a fair bit of time on here and give you some info on the tools that we've used. Monitoring. Monitoring kind of dovetails with the idea of testing. Testing is what you can predict the application will do, and monitoring is what is it actually doing, being able to have visibility into the app. Like I said before, ACA, well, the whole TypeSafe stack, is highly responsive 
a reactive act is literally responsive, and it will change its behavior a lot based on external factors. Load, you know, is the database slowing down? Is the disk slow? Is the disk fast? It'll make a huge difference because the system itself isn't consuming most of the resources. So it's essential to be able to watch how it's going to behave under different scenarios, long before you put it into production, ideally, but definitely once you put it into production. Um, again, the, the perfect scenario is you have a staging machine that is identical to your production machine uh, in configuration and size and capacity, and you take uh, something like Gatling and apply a simulated load. That's good. It won't necessarily be as, as good a simulation as, of course, real users, um, but it can tell you an awful lot fairly early in the process. So monitoring um, is basically what you, how you get that visibility. And that value goes all the way from just the simplest monitoring is checking your services up and running and responding uh, and all the way to detailed timing and stats that let you see things like mailbox sizes, uh, throughput, real-time performance. You can actually have a gauge that says, okay, here's how fast your app is going right now, uh, or here is, here is a trend that's indicating a problem. So what you're looking for in the large is the processing rate of all of your actors within the system to sort of even out. You're looking for flow. <clears throat> it's almost a pattern more than a specific number. You're looking for one actor, you're not looking for one nail to stick up further than the others, so to speak. Uh, you're looking for the system to achieve a certain flow where all of the actors are, are processing at roughly the same rate, because if they're not, then something's filling up and you need to apply back pressure in that situation. So a rapidly filling mailbox is usually the indicator of a problem. Whether it's surge load, that could be fine. You just got a you know a whole bunch of messages uh, came because load suddenly increased sharply over a short period of time. That's perfectly reasonable, or whether it's an actual problem. So monitoring can really help you find the clogs. Our, uh, our production deployments often really did look like uh, NASA's mission control, because we used to have great big monitors with all sorts of charts and graphs, and we'd have a stand-up every morning where we actually looked at our uh, charts every morning to see what the trends were showing us. <clears throat> so one of our favorite, I would call it a simple monitoring tool, it does a little more than monitoring, is uh, Monit, a project called Monit. What we use that for is to make sure our services will restart if the entire JVM fails. So we have it in, in that place. There's other, other tools that will do this. But it can also do some fundamental monitoring, like check this port, make sure you get a response. Make sure you're getting a 200 from this port. Have a look every two minutes. If you don't see that response, restart the JVM. So at the sort of the thin edge of the wedge of monitoring, um, we start with monitoring. It can also do very simple things like email you if a service is going up and down uh, success, successively. It's interesting, in a, in a let it crash system, crashing doesn't necessarily alert you in the sense that at one point we actually had a system running just fine with one service, an, an ACA based service, <clears throat> that was restarting every two minutes. And you know it was it was completely fouled up, and uh, it wasn't supposed to do that. This was not the intention, and it was it was crashing horribly and writing in its log and starting back up. And the system was actually sufficiently resilient that we didn't notice right away. Um, so we actually added something into our monitoring to show us restarts. And when we see too many of them, we go, oh, that might be a problem. But it's not a problem that our users ever noticed, which was pretty impressive. So monitor, good place to start. Very fundamental. Um, where we really get into the meat of monitoring on the projects we've done in any case is uh, we rely heavily on stats, stats D, specifically the stats D uh, daemon, and we e emit stats through, we just write a little trait that we can mix in wherever we need that allows us to emit stats. They're UDP packets, so you're not going to slow down your system or your network too much with them. Um, and then stats D is basically a utility that can listen to those. And then there are some really nice uh, front-end applications that can graph and chart and diagram and put alerts and, and so on on the stats that are flowing from your application. So we, we've tried everything. We've tried uh, aspect aspects to weave in some stats. We have explicit stats. We've actually written a custom mailbox that emits stats. So you can say, what are the NQs versus the DQs, and therefore compute mailbox size and go, OK, here's, here's the size of that mailbox at runtime. <clears throat> and it, it really, the, the individual stats don't help as much as the trends. 
So you actually have to look at the graphs. The, the, the alerts are interesting to say, okay, this got to that level, but you learn a lot from looking at how fast did it get to that level? Does it recover again right away? You know, maybe that's just a surge. That's all right. And what would happen was, like I said, we had a stand-up every day where we'd actually look at our charts and graphs and flip through all the pages and go, okay, what happened over the last, you know, eight hours, 24 hours, whatever it was. And we'd look at the spikes and the funny shapes, if you like, and go, what happened there? What was, what was the action of the system and was it correct? And over time, we'd actually begin to uh, expect certain patterns. And we'd look at it and go, yep, that's the right shape. You could just glance across the room at the big monitor and go, oh, wait a minute, that's not the shape that it's supposed to be anymore. There's something going on. And typically we, could, we found that we could actually catch it early. We'd actually see things happening um, before or early in the sense that before an actual crash happened or before an, uh, users actually noticed the slowdown. So I highly recommend StatsD um, and Graphite and some other, there are some other even better front ends now, I understand. Okay, more on monitoring. Really like our monitoring, as you might have guessed. Um, came on, I assume, is how that's pronounced. I've never heard anybody say the word, but I've, I have used it, um, but only a little. We we have came on is a relatively new, relative newcomer to the monitoring picture, but it is designed specifically for reactive applications, and it can emit its stats and the data that it collects to Stasty, so you can look at it just uh, with with uh, graphite and so on, or it can emit to uh, things like New Relic, which is a commercial service uh, that provides um, other kinds of monitoring. The library goes on your app's class path, and it uses aspects to weave in auto-instrumentation. Um, and it's ideal in combination, we found, this is what we use it for a lot, ideal in combination with load testing to see where the problems might be in an ACA application. I haven't actually deployed it in a production application. We've only used it on applications that were on the bench, so to speak, for, uh, for testing. Um, but I understand a lot of people have had good success. For, for us, the two stats that really matter a lot and that we spend a lot of time looking at are actor processing time and mailbox size. When those start to vary dramatically, um, you likely have a problem. And you could either measure those relatively directly, or you know, I say it relatively because you'd have to measure Qs and NQs and look at the difference, or, or indirectly by just saying, okay, how long has it been since I sent that message and since I got an act back? Um, and so StatsD, of course, does handle both uh, an individual point in time and a time interval. So you can say this is how long this has been taking and then plot that on a graph. Really good stuff. We, uh, we use it a lot. So enough about monitoring. Let me charge on here. I think I'm a little behind time-wise. So one of the things you're looking for when you're talking about deploying an app in production, any app in production, but specifically a, an ACA app, is um, boundary conditions. What goes on at the extremes? It's a little bit, it's like a macrocosm of the microcosm of unit testing. When you're unit testing, obviously, you're, you're doing things like saying, well, what happens if I hand in a zero? What happens if I hand in a null? What are the boundary conditions of this one component that I'm testing? Well, you can also think about that at the system level and say, what are the boundary conditions of my system as a whole and let it crash allows the philosophy allows for a lot more flexibility here than many applications have many applications are well when we hit a boundary condition all the wheels come off and everything dies that's not at all true of a reactive application it uh, responds a lot more politely but think about those extremes what happens when you have no events do you burn a lot of CPU processing nothing what happens when you have the maximum number of events is usually a more interesting question what happens when the disk is full what happens when individual servers go offline? Node failure. Which nodes? So it's almost, a, um, it's almost a chaos monkey kind of problem in the sense that you want to see what happens if that service there is not responsible for a period of time. Do we end up with a cascade failure? Do we end up with the other service isn't affected right away, but over time it begins to fail because there have been no messages from this other service over time? These are things that you can test both experimentally and you can also think about them ahead of time. Um, what happens when mailboxes fill up? That's obviously a big one. And always remember, let it crash. One of the other fail vectors we've seen is people trying to build in really complex failure handling on top of ACA, which has very simple and very powerful failure handling. So that, that is usually a way to, to fail going into production, is to over overcomplexify the boundary conditions, if that's a word. Logging, just very quickly. We'll, we'll try to get to the last couple of, uh, pretty close to the end here. Um, logging, 
very essential, but it's not enough. We like to say that there's, there's two halves, there's logging and there's monitoring, and you can't do without either one of them. But logs can be slow, so be careful uh, when logging at a detail level, particularly if you're doing performance testing, you might get a very different answer. Um, a trick we've found is that it's not very difficult to set up good logging systems to be able to change their log levels on the fly. So if you're starting to see a problem, like one of your graphs is showing you a problem, you can do something like send a message that will increase the log level of a particular service, and then you see where the actual problem's happening. You know, oh, I'm having an error processing this. Well, errors should probably always be logged. <clears throat> we've had a lot of luck with a tool called Graylog to consolidate logs, because one of the issues you have with microservices is if each of them logs, now we've got a whole bunch of logs. So it's very difficult to get that 5,000 foot view, you know, just up a little bit that says, okay, what's happening across all of these services. We've also had a lot of luck by using the map diagnostic context. I think that's a log back feature. Um, and log back is one of the tools that has an appender for gray log. Map diagnostic context lets you, um, what's the right term? It lets you, uh, bolt metadata onto a log message that says, here was the state of this service or the world or this actor when this happened. So you don't just see the log message that says something went wrong, something went wrong and this is what the world looked like at that moment. Map diagnostic context, it's, it's good stuff, have a look. And then the last little thing to think about um, <clears throat> in production is security. Now there's a, this is obviously beyond the normal security concerns any application has. Um, one of the odd ones that we found that is, I suppose, a little bit ACA specific is what do you do about fake messages? What do you do about a message you shouldn't have received? Um, and it, it, there are many different ways to handle that. It's not a terribly complicated problem, but it's one that perhaps you don't think about in many applications. Um, we've actually seen too much security be more of a problem than too little in ACA applications. People have tried to go overboard and highly isolate the system, and then we have to fight with operations to get ports opened. Uh, too much security can be as big a problem. Don't secure yourself from success, I guess is the right way to say that quickly. Okay, so quick summary. I've jabbered on about a lot of things here. To sum it up, it's all, it all starts with the right architecture. That's, that's a no-brainer and, and is probably not news to any of you. Um, but that architecture looks a little differently for, looks a little different, there we go, English, um, for an ACA application than for many other applications. An almost reactive app won't perform like you want it to. Don't forget about back pressure. Um, it's, it's easy to do, but it's easy to forget. It's possible to build a system without it. You're probably going to have some trouble down the road. Um, Test, load, and memory response characteristics up front and measure, don't guess. You, you won't be able to guess, trust me. It'll do things you have not expected. Um, tuning can help enormously. Uh, JVM tuning can help. Give it a little more memory, uh, maybe a bit more than that. Automate your deployment and, uh, and use monitoring. It's more than logging. Uh, logging is good, monitoring is even better. And think about those boundary conditions. Don't secure yourself from success. Okay, <laughs> I think that is everything. Anybody got questions, right. answers? Yeah, it looks like there's some uh, good questions here, Mike. Thanks so much for the presentation. I think we have some uh, time remaining for a Q&A. Um, so Fire away. Stop. Yeah. Um, so, can you share, uh, actually trying to scroll down a little, what uh, percentage of the deployments have you seen used uh, the Java API for ACA? Of the projects I've done, zero. I have never actually worked with the Java API for ACA. Now that might just be my particular circumstances, but I haven't seen it at all. Sorry, not a very helpful answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. You mentioned uh, one of the questions here is if you could share some uh, serializer performance results. I sure um, can. can yeah, I, I was going to post those publicly. They'll be on our blog. Because we okay, were surprised. We kind of went, that's not what we expected. And it's always interesting to share results when they're not what you expect. Right. Cool. That's, that'll be great. We'll point people in that direction when you publish it. Um, do you use any monitoring tools in production? Oh yeah. Um, well, we've just started playing with uh, Kmon, if I'm pronouncing that correct. I see one of the core developers is on the list, but um, we've started tinkering with it. Our, our backbone has been, excuse me, has been StatsD. 
that's been our favorite. And uh, Graphite was what we started with. We've been tinkering with some other front end tools now. So I would say that's our favorite monitoring tool. And it's a little bit um, hand rolled in the sense you have to go in and put those monitoring points in, but you do have very fine grain control. Great. Cool. Um, what, uh, a couple questions just are comments coming in on um, the command. So someone asked, is command by code instrumentation like app D? Um, do you know the answer to that question or could we maybe defer to I do not, but I imagine one of the guys on the list here probably does. He's one of their developers. Um, as far as yeah. I know, it's aspect J weaving. Mm hmm Okay. Uh, well, we can maybe put you guys in touch and you can ask, um, ask Ivan some questions later. Um, so moving on to some logging questions, what specific logging did you find useful? Did you re do you recommend to log very few things and let monitoring find out what's up? Um, or are you more prone to log big? Any thoughts on that? We don't tend to log big, I have to say. I think we, we log about medium. And one of the big tricks was to allow the ability to control the log level at runtime by sending a message. Um, we played with having an SSHD daemon built into the services. Um, that was interesting, but a little awkward to admin. What we found in the end was if we could send a message that said, here, now change your log level to this, um, we had the ability to be able to turn up the logging. And typically it was monitoring that would say, okay, you might have a problem here. You know, we start seeing a funny shape in monitoring, and then we'd send a service a message that says, okay, crank your debug level up, you know, crank, crank your log level up to debug, and then we'd sit and look at gray log for a few minutes and go, okay, what's actually going on here? But I suspect we probably log a little lighter than you might simply because we rely on, on stats and monitoring a lot. Got it. Uh, cool. Um, just uh, maybe have time for one or two more questions. Um, next one, though, could you elaborate a bit on how to utilize back pressure to control mailbox size? Sure. Um, basically, what we we built our own event bus. This was back in the days when uh, many of the other good projects to do this were fairly young. And what we found was that we could, of course, fill up a mailbox very quickly with a slow consumer. So slow consumer is usually the problem. Um, and, or fast producer, depending on which way you look at it. And essentially, having the ability for the consumer to say, either I'm ready, carry on with the next chunk, or I'm not ready, I'm busy, um, slow down, is effectively what we're using for back pressure. Um, so there are messages going in, back, in both directions. Now, Reactive Streams kind of gives you a better solution to that, in my opinion, but it, again, was fairly young when we were starting to solve some of these problems. And in some cases, it's not necessarily the right answer. Does that help, or does that just confuse a little more? <laughs> Hopefully it helps, and um, I think we've mentioned this at the beginning, but if um, we can always share your questions with Mike and he can follow up with you directly in case um, you'd like a little bit more elaboration, but it looks like, Mike, that was helpful. So, um, okay. let's, one more question here. So do you think it would be useful to have a kind of back port that allows us to send message, I, uh, messages, i.e. to change the log level from a CLI? Yeah, we we found it was. We built exactly that. In fact, a little command line app that we could say, hey, send the log message. Um, we didn't bother baking it into a UI because it was usually the developers or the DevOps people doing it. Cool. I think that's very helpful. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, great. Um, I think that about wraps it up. If we didn't get to your question, Mike can follow up with you via email. And I uh, really appreciate everyone joining us today for ACA Days. Um, and these recordings will be available shortly. Just got to do some light editing, and we'll try to get those up on the YouTube channel as quickly as possible. Um, Mike, thanks again for presenting. Always great to have you. And, thanks for the um, opportunity. Yeah, that's great. That about wraps it up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.